welcome to Unity and Diversity Amid COVID-19. This is a discussion between Jewish and Asian American communities. Thank you so much for everyone joining us right now. My name is Courtney Friedman. I'm an anchor and reporter at KSAT 12 News in San Antonio. And I've had the privilege of working with many members of our community in the concept of unity through a handful of my stories. So I'm honored to introduce those guiding us through these issues today. Consul General to Israel, the Southwest, Gilad Katz and San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Thank you both for being here so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to these join stories, you. These stories and conversations, um, as I've said in my stories, are more important now than ever before. We're living in such a polarized, sometimes volatile world right now. And then on top of that, you add the global pandemic that we're dealing with. Anxiety and fear, as we know, have driven people to stereotype and lash out at certain communities specifically the Asian American community and, of course, the Jewish community. I've personally learned while growing up in the Jewish community about our history of persecution and the bias and the hate that constantly comes with that up until today. Um, but Jewish leaders in my own lifetime and my family have taught me that strength in the face of hate is not only difficult, but it's necessary. So this conversation is so crucial. Uh, we know during times of stress and confusion, it becomes so easy to blame and to scapegoat. And as our world grapples with this deadly disease, uh, much of that unfair blame has been placed on the Asian American community. And so on the surface, you, you might see the title of this discussion and think that these two cultures don't have very much in common. But uh, the discussion will not only prove people who believe that wrong, but also give these two different cultures who right now are relating in a very unfortunate way um, an opportunity to lift each other up and create acceptance, transparency, education, and of course, unity. So thank you again for being here. I'd like to start our first part with some opening remarks. Um, Consul General Katz, would you like to say some opening remarks? Thank you, thank you very much. And I uh, agree with what you just uh, said earlier. Uh, I would like to start, first of all, by uh, thanking, thanking uh, the mayor and thanking the uh, San Antonio uh, Council, City Council, by uh, passing the resolution of the denounces bigotry, anti-Semitism, and hateful speech. I think that uh, such uh, a decision, even though it's in a local, uh, important city, but a local community, it is important in a few uh, different uh, uh, perspectives. First of all, it is important for the leadership itself. The leaders came, had st stood up and said out loud that they denounce bigotry, anti-Semitism, hateful uh, uh, um, 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 behavior. It is also important for the communities themselves, the Jewish community, the Asian American community, the black community, all the communities uh, it's important for them, and but most important, it is important for the individual because the individual has to understand that he has the power to make a difference on his life. If one won't understand that he can take his fate in his hands by uh, um, engaging not only with his family and community but with other communities, just like we're doing now, and I thank of course, the mayor in Nuremberg, and I also thank, of course, the Asian, American Asian uh, society here, the community, sorry, in, in San Antonio. But I think each and every one of us must understand that we have the privilege, privilege, sorry, the honor and the duty to make a difference because there's no vacuum. In our world, there's no vacuum. It is or you say your saying or someone else will be there. And we unfortunately uh, uh, have our experience from our history. I'm talking as a, as a Jew, as an Israeli. We have our uh, dreadful history of persecutions and the Holocaust, wars. Uh, and we understood, we know that we have to stand up for what we believe in. We have to share our values with other communities. And we have to believe that we can make a difference and even if it will take a long time and it's a long journey but we have to start walking on that journey and i think that the uh, uh, the leadership of the mayor and the members of the council by having that resolution is a saying that we are now going to 
to see to that, that in San Antonio, San Antonio, one of the largest cities in America, is, is uh, uh, fundamentally uh, uh, understanding the, the importance of uh, denouncing hatred, denouncing violence, denouncing, denouncing uh, anti-Semitism. And I, and I said, I applaud for you, not only as a Jew, not only as an American, but as a human being. I think that that is how the uh, uh, um, mankind can eventually um, walk into a very, very uh, um, light, uh, um, lightened future for all, of, for all of us, for us and for the generations to come. I love that, a human issue. I love the way you said that. Mayor, any opening remarks for you? Great, thank you. Well, it gives me great pleasure to join you all and certainly with Consul General Katz this morning for our virtual panel discussion. We, we have too many virtual discussions these days, but it's good to bridge that um, challenge during this pandemic. Uh, bringing together the Jewish and the Asian American communities on such an important yet sensitive topic. And let me start by saying this is an important topic for me because I am of both Jewish and Asian descent. When I received the invitation from Consul General Katz to participate in the panel, uh, on the topic of unity at a time like this, there was no question in my mind about joining uh, such an illustrious group in an important discussion. And I was very happy to see uh, two of our own active San Antonio community members in the panel, Dr. Bloom, as well as Mr. Kin Wei, who are both adding their voices to the discussion at hand. Um, both of them have played a critical role in our positions on, on these issues. It's also a pleasure to uh, see uh, Mark Tubin, a fellow Texan, and to hear from his, him his perspective uh, of the Jewish American community. My first official visit abroad as mayor was to Israel. At the time uh, there, we visited the Holocaust Museum. Uh, it was followed by uh, a trip to Darmstadt, Germany, that we uh, signed a sister city relationship with. And the juxtaposition of those two visits, I have to say, was profound. The memory of the whole visit, uh, punctuated by the time uh, we spent at the museum, had a lasting impression on me uh, as a mayor, even to this day. And I think it's important for me to share with you, uh, fundamentally, uh, what uh, our uh, administration is built on and how we lead the city. My first act as mayor when I took office in 2017 was to sign uh, a resolution on the International Campaign for Compassionate Cities committing San Antonio to its central tenet, the golden rule, uh, a value espoused in virtually every doctrine uh, known to man uh, and often quoted from the Gospel of Matthew, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In section three of that particular resolution, the city committed to supporting groups and initiatives that will make San Antonio a more compassionate city. And through our faith-based initiative, the city will work with community and neighborhoods to foster compassion in a reasoned and coordinated manner. Uh, I'm now in my fourth year as mayor of San Antonio since signing that resolution in June of 2017. And our community has been tested in a number of ways, but it does make me proud the way we have faced that adversity head on uh, and with the foundation of compassion as our guide. COVID-19 has been uh, a challenge the world over not only for our city, but communities and cities across the country and across the globe. But when I learned uh, that some of our residents of Asian descent had faced harassment uh, and were experiencing discrimination, I knew we had to come out publicly and very strongly and make it known that we would not tolerate hatred, discrimination, or bigotry, uh, which is why we went and approved an anti-hatred resolution, which I signed this summer. Uh, some of our residents uh, come from all walks of life. They practice different faiths uh, with different manifestations of cultural heritage and their family backgrounds. The diversity makes our city stronger uh, and, uh, and, and richer as a result. And, and I want to say that personally because I have those backgrounds and, and mixes in my own uh, family tree. Uh, I think it's critically important uh, as uh, leaders of cities or communities that when hatred or intolerance uh, is manifest and that it's, uh, made, um, it's made visible, that we stamp it out very quickly. Um, hatred and intolerance is a rot uh, and it must be cut out quickly 
or else it will grow. Uh, I think we've seen examples of that even today. Uh, and we have a lot of work to do to address it. So I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, thank you very much, um, Consul General Katz, Courtney, uh, Ken, Dr. Bloom. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, and Mayor, while we're speaking to you, I'd like to ask my first question. Um, one of my questions was, what does it do personally for you to um, put this resolution into order? But you do have, you just explained your personal connection. So I'm glad you already got that out of the way. Um, but also, why is a personal connection as a mayor, as someone in leadership, vital in the fight against hate in a community that many already see as very inclusive? We have a very cultural city as it is. So a lot of people say, it's San Antonio. We don't have those problems. Yeah, and, and that's good reason. We don't, uh, for the most part, but, but it's present. There's no community in the, in, in, in the, in the world that is immune from this kind of uh, intolerance and hatred from time to time. San Antonio is blessed by being a, a confluence of cultures uh, in its hundreds of years of history. One of the ways that we've been able to uh, build community is by working together, getting along uh, because of our differences, not in spite of them, uh, which is why it's that much more important that when hatred and bigotry do make their presence known, that we, again, act very quickly, uh, strongly, uh, and publicly about that, because it can grow. It can grow, and we see leadership now at the national level that has allowed it to grow, and we have a lot of work to undo it in the country. I don't want that to happen uh, in the city of San Antonio. We take it for granted uh, here in San Antonio that, that we are a compassionate community, uh, which is why I think we have to continue to underscore it. I was shocked, for instance, to learn uh, that I'm the only Asian American mayor of a top 50 city in the country. I didn't know that, uh, but I think we have to take, we have to make strides, we have to underscore our values, uh, particularly when they're threatened, even if it's in a small way, uh, we have to make sure that that does not grow. And, and I appreciate that leadership. We've done a lot of stories together, so I know that that is important to the core of our community as well. Um, Consul General Katz, we're talking about leadership. You've been the advisor to Prime Minister Israel Benjamin Netanyahu. It's an incredible thing to have on your resume, but also the experience that you gain, especially when we're living in this time right now, seeing rising acts of anti-Semitism, rising acts of hate, rising acts of violence. I've reported this over the years here, even in San Antonio. Um, what can we do to stop this type of behavior? And is this type of behavior even preventable? Oh, that's a very good question. I think that's the key question, actually, because at the end of the day, we can talk about uh, the situation and we can, uh, I would even say moan about it, but we have to step up and see what can be done. Um, I think there are a few things that can be done. But before doing so, I think what the first thing and the most basic thing is to believe, to really truly believe that things can be changed, that notions can be changed, and that uh, uh, um, the evil doesn't have to uh, uh, prevail the whole time. That's the belief. After understanding that, what can be done is um, a few things. First of all, we have to talk about unity, meaning uh, working together with communities, different communities together have to go, come up together, stand up, understand that it, it's in the interest of all of them. I think it will it will be wrong if only just every community will try to protect itself somehow. That won't work. It, it has to be worked out with all the communities gathering around, understanding that it is their interest and working together may help a lot. The second thing that I think can, sh can be done, should be done, and it is very, very important for the success is not to be a by uh, bystander. That means to stand up, sometimes it's very, very difficult. You don't feel uh, a right doing it. You think someone else may do it. Maybe another time, there are many, many excuses, but at the end of the day, there is a uh, uh, an um, a Jewish uh, saying that uh, one has to be a person when there are in no other persons in his uh, uh, um, in his neighborhood. Meaning, you have to every every single one has to understand that it's up to him. He can make the difference. It's of course there's a community and there are other people, but he has to see himself as the key player, 
And if he stands up and understands that he can make a difference, then each and every one of us together, combined together, can make a difference, all of us together. Well, you know, promoting tolerance and peaceful societies is a value, as you've said, is held between Americans and Israelis alike. I want to pose this question to both uh, you, the Consul General and Mayor. Um, what are some messages that you would like to share specifically with citizens on how they can come together to create unity and how those will become lessons, essentially, for the future generation? So as you said, the time spans, um, this isn't going to this will impact future generations, what we're doing right now. Consul General, you were just talking about this, so why don't you continue with that, and then we'll check in with the mayor. Well, I'm in my nature, I'm very optimistic. So I think even though time, uh, it will take time, and it will be difficult, and there will be, uh, I think, many, many restraints, I truly believe that if we look back to the history we can see today that we are in a different place altogether. Just 75 years ago, the Jewish people went, uh, uh, um, experienced, I think, one of the most dreadful periods in um, history, in the mankind history, the Holocaust. A third of, our, of the Jewish people were murdered in, and executed throughout six years. Six million people, six million uh, Jews, Men, women, children were executed. And here we are, 75 years later, there is the Jewish state. There are the Jewish communities all over the diaspora. We are thriving. And more important, we are today with very, very good relationships with other communities. The Asian American community, for instance, here in San Antonio, with the black community all around the United States with other communities all over the world. And I, when I see what happened during those 75 years, I'm optimistic. I am sure that in 75 years from now, my grandchildren, please God, will see and understand that what we have been doing, we all are, all of us, not only me, but all of us, what we have been doing is our legacy and our, I hope, they will continue what we have, we have been doing here and starting here maybe in a very local community. But I'm totally optimistic. I believe in, uh, in, in the good of mankind and I believe in leadership and I believe in local leadership. I think those leaders are most important. That's why I am very, very happy that the mayor Nuremberg is here with us because he understands the local communities in San Antonio, in great San Antonio, and he is the one that can lead these, uh, these steps in, 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 in not only as a policy, but in our actual life, in our day-to-day -day life. And I am, as I said, I'm very thankful for the council, but I'm mainly thankful for uh, um, uh, the, uh, the leadership that Mayor Nuremberg has been doing. And I hope that we can continue somehow working together for a better, better future. Absolutely. And, and Mayor, I'll let you respond to that as well. You know, the people here of San Antonio, I like that the, the Consul General said day to day. What can our citizens do day to day to promote the resolution you just passed? And how will those become lessons for future generations? Yes, well, certainly I appreciate um, all of the, the words of um, Consul General Katz. Um, this is a, a question that's made very difficult because of the time that we're in with a pandemic and isolation, physical and social isolation is the enemy of, of uh, tolerance. And the more we are enclosed in our own uh, bubble, social bubble or um, alone, uh, the harder it is for us to express tolerance and to, to uh, demonstrate compassion. So. Uh, whether it's in the pandemic and certainly after the pandemic, uh, we have to pierce our social bubbles. Uh, the simplest thing someone can do is uh, walk across the street and knock on their neighbor's doors and get to know them um, because we live in a very diverse community and understanding the, neighbor, the, the backgrounds and the stories and the concerns and hopes of your neighbors across the street uh, quite often can be um, enlightening and help understand that your perspective, your point of view is just one of many in our community, in a community as small as San Antonio. Uh, you, you take that and you build upon that. Uh, I often uh, encourage travel whenever it's possible. 
uh, travel across your city or travel across the world uh, to understand that, you know, we live uh, in a place with uh, a great mosaic of people with different beliefs and different values. Um, we have some universal human values, which is that we treat others the way we want to be treated. Uh, but, but there's a lot of differences and diversity in that, and we all breathe the same air. Uh, that, I think, ultimately helps us to um, live true to the, the notion that we are all in this together. The one thing that I think the pandemic has taught us or has helped illustrate for us is that my health, my well-being impacts someone else's. Uh, and those, uh, the well-being of others impacts me. So it's in the best interest for us to be a well and healthy community together. That's, for me, the fundamental of compassion. And the more that we can get to know that physically, uh, spiritually, socially with one another, even again across the street or, or even next door, uh, the better off we'll be. Well, thank you both so much for your leadership, <clears throat> excuse me, and your time and your guidance to different, I mean, you each have very different um, areas that you are working in, but you're displaying the same types of leadership that gets these conversations going. And I'm just really proud to be a part of these communities, states, regions where these conversations are happening. So thank you both so much for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Courtney, thank you for highlighting these conversations in San Antonio. Absolutely. Thank you. And now we're going to move to the second part of our discussion. I'm going to introduce an incredible panel of three people who will be talking through these issues and how they pertain to our community. Um, I want to introduce Kenyon Hui, who is the president of the Asian American Alliance of San Antonio. Thank you for being here. Uh, Mark Tobin is the Anti-Defamation League Regional Director of our area. And Dr. Maria Danette Lapis Bloom, the co-chair of Research Committee of the Philippine Nurses Association of America. Thank you, all three of you, for being here. Like we said, the diversity of discussion is what's so important, and each of your organizations are, are crucial. Um, so the first question I would like to pose to um, Ken and Mark. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, reporting the news during a global pandemic is difficult. It's the most difficult thing, um, the most challenging thing I've experienced in my career. Um, but that information is new and changing every day, but that doesn't mean the facts become less pertinent. So I know everyone looks to the media right now. There's a lot of, um, there are a lot of issues people have with the media. And I would like to know that during this pandemic, for each, from each of your perspectives, what parts of this reporting do you applaud? And then what topics or subjects do you feel like need more attention or being left out? And I do want to mention that uh, you can talk about the national network news, the local news, or both, but they are different. So <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to start, Ken, please. Good morning, Courtney. So I want to start off by thanking the Israeli consulate staff and Consul General Katz for hosting this groundbreaking event. But I also want to thank um, Mayor Nirenberg for sponsoring San Antonio's anti-hate speech resolution and the San Antonio City Council for passing the resolution. I think it was very courageous for Mayor Nirenberg to propose such a resolution because I'm pretty sure he knew he was going to be criticized by some. But, uh, but Ron knew it was the right thing to do for Jewish and Asian Americans, but even more important for all citizens of San Antonio. So thank you, Mayor, for your courage and leadership. So, Courtney, thank you for your patience. To answer your question of what I feel is lost in all of the, what was and is lost in all of the reporting of this issue is the, the human angle, specifically how hate speech and violence towards Asian Americans have adversely impacted our lives. You know, unfortunately, many Asian Americans are reluctant to speak up since it's not in our culture to bring attention to ourselves. So therefore, it's difficult for people outside of the Asian American community to know of these hate-related occurrences and how they've impacted us. But I see this attitude changing with the popularity of social networking. Now, many Asian Americans, especially the younger generation, feel social with social networking, we can freely express our concerns and grievances amongst our own community. So I believe as we become more comfortable with doing this with social networking, they will also become more comfortable with reporting bad things when they happen to us 
to those especially outside of our community so they'll understand how our lives have been impacted. So there is a website where you can report AAPI hate incidents. The URL is stopaapihate.org. Now, you know, you mentioned, Courtney, that nationally, you know, how is this being reported versus how it's, you know, being reported locally. I believe nationally we're seeing things on the East Coast and West Coast and not from Texas so much. And I believe that's because there are large populations of Asian Americans. Um, I think of the reporting here in San Antonio, I think we're, we're okay. We're okay because we're doing lots of things in the background with the city and within our own community to resolve these hate issues. So I think we're, I think we're doing fine. But I think also tapping into uh, social media with the Asian Americans will help you understand what is going on. That is such an interesting point and is something that I have not been told. So I just want to follow up question. You know, I've actually reached out in the very beginning when we started to see some of these acts coming in, these attacks on the Asian American community here in San Antonio, even though we have such cultural diversity. Um, I, I, everyone I reached out to didn't want to speak about it. So to your point, do you think that that's something that you are trying to further in your community that it's okay to talk about these things outside of the Asian American community? And do you think that's going to help this situation? I think when we looked at, you know, reporting these incidents and talking to the media about this, a lot of our business uh, folks, they were reluctant to do so because they didn't want to bring the bad publicity onto themselves. So, you know, that's really something that we, as, you know, as a culture, need to figure out how to overcome. But I see with our younger generation, uh, they are less reluctant to talk about what's going on. So, so again, you know, for what's good and bad about social networking, I think with, uh, with that, the, the younger Asian Americans are coming out, they are coming out to speak. And, you know, frankly, I look at, you know, some of my organizations in, in New York City, my God, these Asians are speaking out every day about the injustice that's happening out there and the same things out in San Francisco and Los Angeles. So I think you'll see that cultural change happen as, you know, again, as we get more and more of our younger generations involved in, in these issues. I'm really glad to see that shift happening and thank you for sharing that. It's completely understandable why you wouldn't want to talk about something like this, but these discussions are difficult and that's why they're necessary. So thank you for that perspective. Um, Mark, I'd like to ask you the same thing. Um, in, the, in the news coverage, local, national, um, what are you seeing that you applaud and what would you like to see more of? Uh, sure. And, and first, I also want to echo uh, appreciation to the Israeli consulate and Consul General Katz. Uh, for putting together this uh, terrific forum. And I also want to thank uh, as well Mayor Nirenberg and the San Antonio City Council uh, for unanimously passing uh, the anti-hate resolution. Uh, they were the first city to pass it, and uh, the mayor showed great initiative, uh, not only in bringing the resolution to a vote, but also in withstanding uh, the subsequent attacks from those who continued to use the pandemic as a reason to spread hate. Uh, it inspired other jurisdictions in Texas and around the country uh, to also pass anti-COVID hate resolutions. Uh, ADL decided to promote passage of anti-hate resolutions starting in San Antonio uh, because there was a clear need for public officials uh, to state clearly and publicly uh, that contrary to the statements of, of some uh, public officials, uh, that the pandemic will not be used to promote hate against Asians, Jews, Muslims, immigrants, and other people, and that the focus uh, should be on healing and, and keeping people safe. And so we greatly appreciate uh, the courage that uh, the mayor showed. Uh, and this was soon after there was actually a, a really potentially deadly attack in Midland uh, where uh, a family was attacked. Uh, the person thought they were Chinese uh, in a, uh, I think it was a Sam's Club. And, and those people were still healing from this, uh, from this knife attack. Um, and one of the things that uh, you talk about with, with the media as you know, sometimes it takes an attack like that in order to get the attention um, to these issues. Uh, the more subtle kinds of discrimination aren't really covered. And, you know, one of the things that I think is particularly lost is sort of the pervasiveness of the discrimination and hate and animosity uh, directed towards the Asian community. Um, you know, as Ken pointed out, 
Uh, there have been a number of incidents that have been reported. Uh, we also have a ADL report incident database. Uh, and there have been thousands of incidents reported across the country. Um, but this number doesn't even come close to the actual number of incidents that Asian Americans are encountering. Uh, these may range from you know, loss of revenue from people who are not frequenting Asian-owned businesses uh, to hateful comments to cyber hate uh, to creating uncomfortable environments to physical assaults. Um, also, the consequential damage uh, caused by conspiracy theories uh, really isn't being covered uh, as well as it needs to be um, because these theories that lay the blame for COVID-19 on Jews and Asians and immigrants, uh, they spread these, these hateful ideas and more often than not, these theories are emanating from extremist groups um, who are looking to score points, who are looking to recruit members. Uh, but these theories ultimately bubble up into to the more mainstream conversation. And not only do they contribute to the aforementioned acts of hate, uh, but also to the public confusion and misunderstanding of the disease. How important is it and how difficult is it for community members who are being persecuted, whether it's small or large, to actually gain the courage to report that or talk to a reporter. A lot of times you have to hear from those people, but I can imagine you, you wouldn't want to in a situation like this. I mean, it's kind of a conundrum that these people are in where they feel attacked, but they, it's hard to stand up for yourself. What, what are you seeing in other communities that's working, that might work in our community? Well, that was the, probably one of the key reasons why we decided uh, to pursue the resolution initiative. Uh, we felt that um, if people knew that their leaders uh, in their own jurisdictions uh, were standing up front and calling out these acts of hate and expressing support, that, that people would feel more comfortable um, in doing exactly what you just said. And, and so that we thought that was a critical first step. Uh, we actually, uh, in Houston, uh, we formed what we call the Working Group on Coronavirus Hate. I, I think it was in uh, April or May. Uh, it was members of uh, ADL here in Houston, as well as uh, community leaders uh, in the Asian community in the greater Houston area. And so in, in conversation uh, with this group, uh, that's where we, we came up with the idea to pursue this resolution uh, as a way of letting the communities know um, that essentially, leadership had their back because there were contrary messages being spread um, by by some politicians around the country and uh, you know there was the thought that that was keeping certain people from from speaking out well with that being said you if people aren't comfortable you know going public you never want to to make somebody and push somebody outside of their comfort zone but you do want to create an environment to where they they do feel comfortable doing so if they're if they're willing. That's a great point. So I mean, we're taking steps in the right direction, especially with leadership. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Bloom. Uh, Dr. Bloom, you have so much insight into this crisis from different directions. You're a first responder on the front lines of this pandemic, and your organization represents Asian American healthcare professionals. So, what trends have you seen in your work in your personal life? Um, and how has that impacted your organization? Thank you, Courtney. Um, first of all, I would like to echo everyone about uh, thanking the Consul General, the Consulate for um, this, initiating this activity to highlight important issues uh, in terms of being unified against anti-racism. I also would like to thank the mayor for the uh, passing the anti-hate speech uh, resolution and uh, really congratulating him and the leadership of San Antonio for really managing well the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I think we were streets ahead of every other city that I read of in terms of managing this. So I, I, that's true. I am uh, the board member of the Philippine Nurses Association of San Antonio and uh, a chapter of the Philippine Nurses Association of America and serves as co-chair. I also uh, am in the Texas Nurses Association and all other organizations. And one of the things that, that really came out um, in early COVID and once this was declared as a pandemic was the NAA uh, formed a task force which looked at uh, not only here in San Antonio, but all the other uh, 45, more than 45 states where PNAA chapters are located. And a lot of those issues early on were related to the limited uh, PPEs, personal protective um, 
devices. So that was really the main thing that came out. But later on, when COVID was actually, um, I guess, named as the Chinese virus, there were a lot of things that our nurses and other healthcare professionals of Asian heritage, or they look Asian, uh, that they were, they were experiencing. So they not only go and um, risk their lives in providing care for, for individuals, but they also, when they go out of the workplace, they were also subject to a lot of uh, verbal and uh, physical abuse. I, I, am, uh, I have a project that actually is based in five states, California, Hawaii, New York, and New Jersey. And one of my leaders in um, California shared that, you know, like uh, one of the nurses went to a bakery and this person refused to serve her because she's Asian and she has the Chinese virus. Um, in New Jersey, they were uh, telling, uh, one shared about uh, the car being egged or something like that. And as uh, uh, Mr. Wee mentioned, uh, the AAPI uh, network that uh, reports this in July, about 1900 uh, uh, cases were reported and that's really really a very small fraction because as a, as a, as a community we're not used to speaking out and this has affected a lot of not only with the covid component in terms of infection uh, which poses a, a lot of risk for the uh, practitioners lives for the healthcare providers lives but also when they go outside there is this added uh, stress with regards to things that are are being done to them in terms of verbal. And there were also a lot of other workplace discriminations. For example, there were reports that patients were requesting that they not be treated or cared for by someone who is Asian. So I, I, I believe that really affected a lot of our um, healthcare professionals, not only nurses, uh, but um, all the other professionals as well. That's just heartbreaking, too, because you guys are the ones on the front lines. You're the ones that are helping save people's lives. Does that, do you think this has discouraged Asian Americans from wanting to work in healthcare right now? Have you heard of that? Um, I, I have not heard about that. I think there is a great uh, kind of like cultural push for helping others. And uh, as a Filipino, uh, being a nurse is like, oh, like, like a label, like an, an honor for us. A, a lot of, that's about over 300,000 Filipino nurses in the Philippines. And I don't know if you heard here, but a lot of our nurses here also contribute to our co country. They, they send a lot of money back home. Uh, they work two to three jobs. And in the midst of this pandemic, uh, if you know, 4% uh, of the nurses in America and the nursing workforce in America is, uh, are Filipinos. But actually 30% 30, 30 of uh, those who died from COVID were Filipinos. So that's very, very disproportionate. And a lot could be learned from that because um, I have heard of reports in California where they were not actually um, recruiting more personnel to cover for COVID. So they were, they were requesting their, their existing Filipino nurses to work double shifts uh, and so on and so forth. And because of the need to send uh, money back home and financial support back home in the Philippines, they, they are doing that kind of thing. And also with, uh, same with what uh, Ms. Mr. Wee mentioned earlier, you know, we, we are very proud of the work that we do and we are very concerned about the patients and to a degree to a fault maybe that we're risking our lives, but also we don't like to speak out. And, but the tides have turned a little bit because those second generation, those who were born here in the United States and those who are, there are also some leaders that are really, really, speaking out and you know we need more ppes uh i am also an uh, i work at the ut health san antonio school of nursing as a, an academician and i've heard a lot of reports from my students where they are where they were like reusing their ppes so that was really really very heartbreaking not to have uh been like they don't feel protected uh they that their lives were not valued enough that they be protected while they're doing the work that they were supposed to do. Right, and thank you for sharing all of that because I know even though you are a spokesperson for this, it's not easy to just come out and talk on behalf of people who are being um, hurt and, um, and put bias upon. Um, Ken, I wanted to ask this because I know that we had just talked about 
you said this, and then also Dr. Bloomy just said, well, they thought we were Chinese. I think this is a big, maybe a big reason to be educating people right now that not all Asian people are going to be Chinese. I mean, that's a, that's a ridiculous thing to think of, but people don't, are not educated culturally. How important is that to stopping these types of things from happening, Ken? Well, you know, Courtney, that's a great question. And, you know, for someone who's grown up here in San Antonio, lived here for 52 years, I think it really starts at the school. You know, we really need to improve our curriculum that's more inclusive of all the different cultures. Because, you know, my daughter was just telling me, you know, she was in middle school and she actually saw a picture of, a, of, of Chinatown in one of her textbooks. It's like, this is crazy. So I think we need to improve the education of our students and that's where it needs to start. And then as the mayor mentioned also, we need to interact with our neighbors. You know, expand your uh, horizon. Travel if you can. If you can't, get on the internet and see how different people live, right? Because again, understanding uh, the different cultures will lead to a better acceptance and tolerance of other people and other cultures. You know, that is a great thing to mention, too, to get out in your neighborhood. San Antonio, I mean, we've done stories on this for um, a lot of our series with diversity. San Antonio historically is culturally segregated from way back when. Do you feel like that's still an issue? Like your neighbors look a lot like you, our neighbors look a lot like us. Do you think that's a problem? Actually, I did. You know, when you, when you talked about that, I was thinking about my neighbors. So across the street, I have a lady from Taiwan. On my other side of the street, I have two black families, Hispanic family, and to my left, I have a white family. And then across the street on the other side, I have a Hispanic family. So in, in my neighborhood, we are very culturally diverse. Now, you know, growing up in San Antonio in the early 70s, you kind of knew where different neighborhoods were. But, you know, nowadays, uh, especially, you know, in the suburbs, I think we're very, very uh, culturally diverse and we're, we're, we're mingling quite well. You know, you go to HEB, I mean, for the longest time when I was growing up here, I could not find any Asian products at HEB. But now I go in, my gosh, there's a section of Asian goods, not, 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 maybe not the best, but again, <laughs> there is a section and I can actually go to H-E-B and Walmart and find Asian vegetables. So again, you know, well, we're not all there yet, but we're getting there. And you know, with the 2020 census, I think we're gonna find that our numbers have grown significantly since the census was taken in 2010. That's a really interesting point. Uh, Mark, wh why don't you add on to that? I mean, just the smallest things are available to us having conversations with neighbors that, yeah, you might live in a diverse neighborhood, but that doesn't mean you're actually taking the effort to converse with people and ask questions about their culture. Have you found with the Anti-Defamation League that those simple things make a big difference or are there bigger steps that we can be taking daily? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. There are, there are small steps and there are large steps and, and there are, you know, interim steps. Uh, I, I think it was, I, I can't remember who said it earlier today. This is a, uh, this is, change doesn't happen overnight and it happens gradually. And it happens because uh, there are small conversations between neighbors, uh, but it also, you know, happens because leaders uh, take giant steps as well. Uh, and it has to happen uh, all at the same time in order for there to be progress. And so, uh, yeah, we, you know, we encourage that. We convene, um, you know, people from different walks of life uh, as often as possible uh, to, to have conversations. Uh, it's critically important, uh, but it can't just happen in some sort of formal kind of dialogue uh, or, or group effort. Um, it needs to be sustainable outside of that. Uh, because uh, that's that's where change really happens, not just in some sort of you know uh, formal atmosphere. And so uh, we we hope to you know sometimes it needs to be jump started, uh, but we hope that it uh, continues beyond that.
And and by the way, I, I just want to add that I know the uh, a mayor I said that I was a, a native of Texan, but I'm also a native of San Antonio. So I, I too grew up in San Antonio. So I just wanted to uh, to, to mention that. And, yeah, which uh, is great to know because we have people from so many parts of this community and that makes me excited because I'm a transplant too. So, I mean, I've lived in cities all over the world and this is one of the ones that um, has made me want to be so proud of the diversity and the way that we're taking steps to, you know, kind of integrate all of our cultures. But it, like you said, it doesn't just happen overnight. You actually have to make that effort. Um, a lot of people um, in big cities are taking pledges, um, pledging for practices for promoting solidarity and awareness. What types of things are you seeing in that setting that we could do better in our community, in, in San Antonio, maybe in Texas? Um, what can organizations or people pledge to do better? Um, you know, there's there's a couple things, really. Um, you know, the first is to uh, to not to not accept hate uh, in you know in any in any form, um, and you know whether that is some form of uh, you know inappropriate joke or whether it is discrimination uh, against a colleague or you know something worse uh, because while sometimes you know people consider some sort of you know either ethnic or religious joke some sort of innocuous um it has the it, it always bubbles up it always goes higher you know what we call the pyramid of hate uh, and it's it's not about what people think uh, hurts other people. It is what is hurting people that matters. Mm -hmm. And and people really need to, um, you know, if you want to have say people take a pledge, it is to take a pledge to uh, be empathetic in, in terms of what actions are hurting other people and not what you think is or isn't hurting people. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really. Uh, if, if people think of it that way and not just, well, they shouldn't be upset by this, but think about it as if somebody says that they are hurt by something to stop doing it, that can go a long way to uh, lowering the level of, of hate and not allowing the people who are really fomenting hate, the extremists, uh, to establish um, a basis for for their activity. Yeah, it seems like a small thing, but it makes a huge difference when you Absolutely. see people intentionally trying to spread hate. So yeah, I really love that. It's something you, you wouldn't really think of. Um, Dr. Bloom, in your multiple organizations that you are involved with, you must be a very busy woman. Um, what kind of pledges are you willing to make um, on behalf of yourself and throughout your organizations to further this type of discussion in your communities? So I see a really positive uh, movements within the organizations where, for example, uh, the PNA at the national level, where we're collaborating with other organization, minority organization, and uh, like the American Nurses Association as well, to, so that we could actually work together uh, to address issues like this, uh, systemic racism. Uh, at our local level, the San Antonio Nursing Consortium was um, made with, uh, created with participants from diverse uh, backgrounds, uh, organizations from diverse backgrounds. And we just had a meeting yesterday where we're going to uh, honor nurses, heroes of COVID as part and making it as more diverse and more inclusive as, uh, as, as possible. I think that's uh, that's a way to go, but I do, from a mental health perspective, I think we really need to start with education of the person. Like, you know, we have to instill the self-love and the respect for oneself so that we have the courage to actually, what um, uh, Mr. Tovin has uh, mentioned, you know, like stand up. If uh, that hurts you, you can say that it hurts you. Because if the other person does not know that it hurts you, then that person wouldn't have any clue of, of what it, effect it has of you. And I think, like it was mentioned earlier as well, like making the stand, not be a bystander. And it takes a lot of guts and self-love and self-respect to be able to do that. I think we should 
start with a man in the mirror. I think we should start with ourselves, really like um, empowering in each individual to, to be able to speak out and if they do feel hurt to, to state so. And for I, I really like uh, what uh, Mr. Tobin mentioned that you know if you you it's not about the other my your perspective it's the other person's perspective and to be able to I think those skills are something that needed to be taught so as early as as Mr. Wee has mentioned as early as like elementary years like developing these kids like the emotional intelligence to be able to see what are the effects of the things that we're doing the the self awareness of what 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 are the effects of the things that we do the second thing that i think is very very useful from uh, my travels all over the world is the fact that you can't be just because you experience something from one person you can't label that person as you know all the whole ethnicity or the whole country that person came from as what they would do i think different folks different strokes so i think you have to 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 um view it as that person doing it to you rather than you know uh all filipinos are like that or something you know and the other perspective is like really education just science you know viruses do not have nationalities like hello it's like they're all over the place you know they don't have passports or identification like it's a virus there's no nationality associated with it what incredible points i especially like you know that hasn't been talked about in this type of perspective is starting with self-awareness and self-love i just absolutely love that point it's very powerful um and it can what kind of pledges are you while you're listening to these types of pledges can you relate to any of those do you have any personally or that you you soon want to get off of this call and share with your organization for the future well you know i think um knowing and understanding uh the different cultures and appreciate the differences you know we're not going to have everybody embrace everybody else but it's really just appreciating the difference and i'll tell you with the um Asian American Alliance of San Antonio, we have 23 uh, Asian organizations under our, our umbrella. And it's the different, different cultures in, from, from Asia. We have Pakistanis, we have Asians, I mean, Indians, we have Filipinos, we have Vietnamese, uh, Chinese, I mean, mainland Chinese, Taiwanese Chinese, mm -hmm. Hong Kong Chinese. So again, there's a difference, a melting pot of the different cultures. And yet, we're able to work together and appreciate. I mean, I'll tell you, it wasn't until last year that, you know, me, I'm a Chinese guy, that I stepped foot into a mosque. And what a beautiful ceremony it was. But again, I, you know, without knowing my, my friends who are Muslims, I would not have been able to do that. So again, it's really about embracing the, the, the different cultures that exist here in San Antonio and stepping outside of our comfort zone. And then we have a lot of those here in San Antonio, different cultures. The you're right. The opportunities to do that are endless. And mm -hmm. I'm just inspired by all three of you. Thank you for the work that you're doing and for the powerful points that you brought up today. I've learned a lot and I, I work in journalism, so I'm speaking to different people every single day. And this is just um, a really incredible discussion that I'm honored to be a part of. Thank you for the consulate for asking me to moderate this. This is wonderful. And I can't wait this, uh, for this to be shared with people. But um, you guys are really all making contributions to our society. So thank you. And to those who are joining, to those who have listened in and have learned things as well, thank you for taking the time and energy um, to learn more about this and how we can better our community. Um, have a great day, everyone. Have a great weekend. And please be safe. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Thank you.